Welcome to the We Are Libertarians presidential series debates. This is part of a series of 10 debates with every candidate for president formally invited to participate and provide their ideas on a variety of issues. Today I'm joined by Daniel Berman, Christopher Marks, Arvind Vora, William Hurst, and Benjamin Letter, all libertarian candidates running for president, and we'll be discussing immigration. Candidates, you'll have two minutes to answer each of these questions. At the end of your allotted time, I will simply say time, and you must quickly wrap up your, your thought. You may also yield your time when the answer has been completed. I will ask the question and call on you in a random order to answer. While I am a libertarian, I've designed these questions to be challenging and have modeled both the questions and the format after the major presidential debates, not the friendly formats that you might be used to. My audience is tasked with evaluating the quality of your responses. I'll be judging you based on how prepared you are for the challenges I propose, how well you understand the question that I asked, and how you manage your time. Also, how compelling your answers are to all Americans, not just libertarians, and how likely it is that it will make them vote for you. At the end, you'll be given three minutes to issue a closing statement, which you may use to summarize your feelings on immigration, challenge an opponent's response to, to a question, and or address an issue that you don't feel got brought up adequately during the debate. Candidates, here we go. The wall is perhaps the most divisive concept in politics today. Seeing as how the president is tasked with providing for the common defense, how would you live up to this promise when it comes to the borders of our nation? Give us your security plan for those affected by the violent crime associated with living in these areas. And we will start with Dan Berman. Hey, so a uh, great question. There's a lot of concern about uh, what would happen to the border, especially if the libertarian open border position uh, became a reality and borders were open and it was a free for all. Um, I want to point out that this is, it's not, um, it's not as big as of a concern as people make it seem. We saw some footage from a news report uh, a few, I think it was last week, where a guy was wearing a bulletproof vest and it was all staged. Um, I've lived very close to the border uh, in South Texas for a long time. Uh, I know other people who live all along that border and there isn't that big of an issue. Now, the, the issues that we do have, of course, are all results of the drug war. And when we end the drug war, a lot of that's gonna go away. And some of the other issues about the welfare state, you know, people are afraid that people are going to come here, take jobs, uh, take welfare programs, be an expense for the taxpayers. That's not that big of an issue either. In fact, I've been spending the most of the last two years in Mexico. I know people who are uh, Mexican nationals. They have no interest in going to the U.S. I know people who have gone to the U.S. to try it out and, and have a job, and they came back because they didn't like it. Um, America is not that great. Uh, to a lot of people, not everyone's trying to get in. So, uh, so a lot of these concerns are overblown by the media who basically makes their money by exaggerating problems so they can keep you watching. And um, you know, once we solve the problems that do exist, once we end the drug war, we're actually going to make it easier to create um, a, a, more, um, a more efficient and a, and a more uh, interesting um, immigration process so that people can come here legally and contribute to our society. Great. Let's uh, move that question along to uh, Ben Letter. Uh, there. there you go, Ben. Um, well, the wall. I mean, whether it's a ladder or, or a grappling hook, it it doesn't it doesn't deliver what 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 it's promised security wise. Um, and in reality, if there was a genuine crisis down at the border that was as bad as some people would have you believe, they would be calling for volunteers like they did in Hurricane Harvey. There'd be, there'd be like militia guys showing up down there. It'd be a big thing. It'd be on the news. Um, you would see that. But they're, they're not asking for volunteers because it's not, it's not really a crisis. They just want to feed. Uh, a, a bureaucracy, a broken bureaucracy that's costing us a lot of money and really isn't <clears throat> doing anything to solve any of the problems, even the ones that they overinflate the existence of. Uh, I think what we want uh, as, as people um, is, to, is to be able to travel. Um, and one thing that I see, you know, uh, with the, uh, the libertarian perspective is, you know, and a lot of people, they talk about 
immigration coming in here. And this is one of the easiest countries to immigrate to, even though our immigration policy is not all that hot. Uh, but I would like to see us negotiating a better, better deals to where we can, we can go to other countries, start businesses, and we can have a, 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 some type of re reciprocation. Um, as far as the term open borders is concerned, it's a good term, but you know, it's, it's as far as how do you define that, that is it, does it end up being good or, or not? And without uh, some type of re reciprocal uh, citizenship agreement or some type of agreement in place, uh, we're never gonna get anywhere. So I think we really need to look uh, to our libertarian uh, legislative candidates. Time to uh, start working on some legislation that answers these problems because without that uh we don't have we don't have anything to hold up sure. um so i would appreciate everybody's help on developing some legislation to to accomplish this there you go uh arvin uh, you are next in line a wall is a bad idea and if a wall was a good idea if a wall was a good way to prevent crime or a necessary way to pre prevent crime it would make just as much sense to put a wall between Detroit and Ann Arbor, or between, between Baltimore and Bethesda, Maryland, or between the most dangerous parts of Miami and Palm Beach. Walls are unnecessary because the free market naturally regulates crime. In order to actually be in a position to be in a highly wealthy, highly successful area, you need to actually have some skills. And if you don't have any of those skills, you're never going to be in any of those places in the first place. Let's talk about what an effective immigration policy would actually look like. Today's immigration policy is backwards. It's keeping out highly skilled workers. It's keeping out entrepreneurs. It's keeping out job creators. What we should do is the opposite, and that's what I want to do. I want to get rid of all or almost all restrictions on immigration. If you're a skilled worker, come on over. If you're an unskilled worker, but a hard worker, come on over. The only restriction that I want to put is a restriction on welfare. I want there to be absolutely no welfare, and that includes government schools, and that includes Section 8 housing vouchers, that includes food stamps. I want there to be no possibility for welfare at all for any new immigrants. I also want there to be no possibility of welfare for anybody. anybody. But if, we, if the compromise is just no welfare for new immigrants, there are millions and millions of people who would be lining up for that. We can bring in the best and brightest into America by getting rid of these policies. I wanna close by just giving a quick story about just a job. Imagine one job, say a computer programming job, that job could be shipped overseas or somebody from overseas could come and do it over here. Either way, the job's gonna get done. But in that second situation, that person who comes over here is gonna be going to American restaurants, American stores, Fine. sending his kids to American uh, private schools, benefiting the United States. Right now, what we're having instead of bringing people here is we're just letting the jobs go out. And that's exactly wrong. Open Borders is going to bring manufacturing back. It's gonna bring tech back. It's gonna bring so many jobs and so many opportunities back. So my position remains today as it has always been, no borders, no welfare. All right, and let's move it along to uh, William Hurst. Hi, uh, could you repeat the last part of the question real quick? Yeah, you bet. <clears throat> Seeing as how the president is tasked with providing for the common defense, how would you live up to the promise for the border, borders of our nation? Give us your security plan for those affected by violent crime associated with living in those areas. All right. Uh, we're, we're taking it on a basis that it is a big problem. It, in comparison to living with actual other Americans, uh, nationalized Americans, there's less of a problem. Uh, in order to secure the border, if that remains necessary after other things that we may discuss tonight, uh, there is there's the means of having a semi-digital border where we can keep an eye on who comes in, who comes out, uh, without impeding normal traffic. Uh, you still have the right on your land to say, I want these people to come across. I don't want people to come across. Uh, 
but we should not have any sort of government controlled wall. Uh, as far as the people who do commit crimes, uh, we do need to make, uh, or we do need to talk to the other countries and Sorry, my brain's diffed on me right now. <laughs> uh, I will go ahead and yield my time. All right, let's move along to Christopher Marks. Hi, this is Christopher Marks. Thus far, we have, as taxpayers, paid already $1 billion to the wall. The wall is going to have a nice sneeze guard at the bottom and is going to be built up of these 20-foot high posts Congratulations, America, you now have the most inglorious chain link fence def uh, uh, Department of Defense funded wall in all of the globe. And the good news, it's gonna keep costing you money. It's anticipated to be finished by October of 2020. So as far as my conversation is, Building a wall is not, a, is not something that I need to be concerned about. It's going to be maintaining the chain link fence we have around our nation. Um, it's going to cost you electrical costs because they're going to light the chain link fence. And we are going to have to fund manpower personnel to patrol our nation's chain link fence. And then you have the regular degradation of said chain link fence as well as you know manipulation from people that want to come to our nation and contribute to the overall gdp product of our nation we have a ridiculous situation so probably what i would do is i would actually start putting up uh ultra uh, infrared cameras and then connect that to a database that did vision, vision scanning. And then I would task ICE with patrolling this digitally utilizing drones to track people that are trafficking in trucks and big sleds and things that are of consequence that may be alarming to national security. But individuals coming here to work, kind of, kind of pointless to send people out to go wrangle them up deport them, which is going to cost you money, detain them, which is going to cost you money. I'm trying to run a business here, America. We need to do budget cuts. All right. I'll give the rest of my time. Uh, good deal. Let's move along. Next question we have here is, we're just assuming now, if a wall is constructed by the time you were elected, would you spend taxpayer money to take it down? Or would you modify it to your standards? Would you get rid of it for ethical reasons? Or is there a better option? Some of you might be familiar with this question. It was submitted by your uh, fellow uh, William Hurst. So I'll go ahead and give him first crack at the question. Go ahead, William. Uh, I think we should just allow the property to revert back to the original owner. They could do with that section of wall, whatever they choose to do, uh, tear it down and recycle it, earn some money from it. Uh, there are segments near the crossing that we do need to keep, uh, and it's just for obvious reasons. Like, hey, you want to cross the border? Uh, there's going to be a wait, so why not just walk around? Oh, there's a wall there. Uh, but yeah, as far as that goes, the only thing that I would do is let the property owners handle as they choose so they can have their property back. All right, we'll move along to you, Arvind Vora. One of the great things about the free market is that it can turn something heinous and ugly into something positive and actually make a profit doing that. Today, individuals and organizations, museums all over the world have purchased pieces of another famous wall, the Berlin Wall. And that's brought in both revenue for the people who are buying and selling it, as well as knowledge and a, and a, and a sense of proximity to history for those who are fortunate enough to get to actually experience what it's like to be close to a large piece of the Berlin Wall. I had this experience not long ago when I was looking at various, uh, various famous, uh, 
buildings created, uh, various buildings created um, by Frank Lloyd Wright, who, as you know, is the inspiration for, uh, for Howard Rourke and Anne Rand's Fountainhead. So what I would do with the wall is I would do to it exactly what was correctly done, in my opinion, with the Berlin Wall, which is I would let the free market handle it. And I bet before long, we would see pieces of it showing up in jewelry, showing up in avant-garde artwork, pieces of it spreading around, doing something actually useful, doing something exciting, doing something creative. So I don't think that we would need any taxpayer dollars to tear it down. It didn't take taxpayer dollars to tear down the Berlin Wall. It took individual action and people realizing that walls that pointlessly separate people are not a good idea and that freedom of travel benefits people on both sides of that wall. So my solution to the wall, my solution if I'm elected, is I'm gonna pull all the security away, all the militias away, all the soldiers away, and say to all the artists, all the builders, all the scrap metal sellers out there, have at it. Great, let's uh, go over to Will, uh, Christopher Marks. Well, being that it's a, this chain link fence is, subje is uh, objectively going to be finished October 2020, um, I don't think that there's going to be any historical value in it. I think that the best thing would be to, like William said, uh, revert the land that's been seized through eminent domain back to the original property owner and allow them to recycle it, repurpose it, or do whatever they want with it. Um, because quite frankly, it's just a garbage, pol a, it's a garbage policy really. And it is billions of dollars of waste. And quite frankly, as an American, I believe that if we were gonna build a wall, we would look at the Great Wall of China, we would see it in all of its magnificence, and then we would up the game because this is America. We should have motion detection at the end of a blur, at the sides of a wall if we're gonna have a wall. And whenever somebody approaches said wall, fireworks and pyrotechnics will explode in the air to let people know that they have appeared on a United States of America soil and that that is something glorious to behold. You're not gonna get over the wall, but hey, I don't believe that the wall is necessary and I certainly wouldn't advocate for that much wasteful tax spending dollar. I'll yield the rest of my time. All right, let's move on to uh, Daniel Berman. So I hear some great answers so far and I absolutely believe any, any land that's been taken by eminent domain should be returned to its rightful owner, very first. Um, second, you know, like Arvin said, let the people do it. Let, let people do whatever they want with it. It's, it's public, it's nobody's property. It's just a thing, um, you know, maybe we'll leave segments up as, as, a, uh, as a statue of stupidity uh, for things that have happened in the past. Um, you know, maybe it'll end up in museums. Another interesting concept that, you know, we have 4th of July, which is supposed to um, celebrate our independence from tyrants. And we usually spend that sitting around cooking hot dogs and, and doing things that really aren't that uh, uh, memorable of, of the actual spirit of the holiday. So maybe the thing to do is every 4th of July, people will go and they'll camp out near the wall. And as part of 4th of July, they'll tear it down. And that would be actually something productive to do on the 4th of July to celebrate our freedom and independence to say that we are not, we came to this place to get away from tyranny and now we're tearing down the walls that are trying to keep us in like prisoners. Um, that's something that could actually be constructive that would, that would help to propagate the idea that, that the United States is a free country. And, you know, we have the right to travel. We, we shouldn't have walls between us. There have been Supreme Court cases going all the way back to the 1800s that say, you know, the right to travel is an unalienable right. And so that's, walls are just getting in the way. And, you know, tear them down or fly over them, who cares? Great. Uh, Benjamin Letter will end with you. Well, I think I answered this question in the comments of uh, one of your posts, I would hear something to the effect of it, uh, where it's just like, you know, let people spray paint it, uh, turn it into a mural um, artwork. I don't think there's a reason that, you know, we really need to do much or spend any money on it. I mean, especially for the portions of their chain link fence within 
a few years, you know, the earth will begin to take that back. That's chain link fences aren't built to last. Um, it's not like uh, the Great Wall of China or anything. Uh, so, no, I don't think we need to spend any money on it. Great. Let's move on to the next question. As president, you will have the opportunity to create immigration protocol and guidelines. What are important determining factors in who gets in the country and who stays out? Would you keep everyone out, let everyone in, or is your policy somewhere in between that? And we will start with Christopher Marks. You know, I'm a firm believer in the rule of law. And here in America, you cannot be, have any of your rights removed or restricted unless, of course, you are criminally adjudicated for a felony or capital offense as per the First Amendment or the Fifth Amendment. I am a strong believer that unless you have criminally convicted somebody, you cannot commit, you cannot impose any travel bans. That you cannot remove or deprive anybody or deprive anybody or restrict anybody's rights unless they've been criminally adjudicated. We are not a rule, a land of, ah, eh, well, I suspect. Um, I really think that that's, that's important. We have currently, we have Americans that are having, that have travel bans placed upon them because of some prism investigation that has snooped through your emails and doesn't know have enough common sense to dictate determine satire sarcasm or any tone of voice when you're communicating with each other um then we have the sovereign citizen movement um which is an oxymoron if you understand what it is to be sovereign and what it means to be citizen so please stop saying sovereign citizen um, you know, I think that we need to actually go and look into it. And then when we also review this, we also need to look at ourselves. For over 30 years, we have been bombing the Middle East. We have been murdering people in the Middle East, family, friends, and fellow villagers. You're going to have a grudge. So maybe we take this time. This 2020 presidential administration, and we actually stop terrorizing our global community. All right, we'll move on to uh, Dan, uh, Dan Berman. So this is an interesting question, and this is one where emotions really run high because you know the libertarian position uh, for a lot of people is to open the border, and a lot of people are concerned that that's going to basically open the floodgate where you're going to get a lot of. Um, unsavory people coming in. Um, I don't believe that to be true, but because you know we, we are a society of hundreds of millions of people and we have that system in place, we need to systematically dismantle it. Um, you know, this is, it's a relatively new uh, system that's in place. You know, it's only a few hundred years old. Before, uh, before we came to the United States, to America, um, and, and to take over and to slaughter all of the Native Americans and, and everything bad that was done um, in the history of this country, people were able to just travel freely up through North America all the way down through South America. Um, you know, a lot of what, what people refer to as Mexicans are, um, they're Europeans. And before that, in, and there are still some, um, uh, some people in, in Mexico and further in South America, there are indigenous people and they're more closely related to, to Native Americans. What right do we have to tell them, hey, your ancestors have been traveling up and down this entire continent um, or these two continents for you know, the past you know, however many centuries and now all of a sudden we came along and stuck a wall here and you don't have that right anymore. It doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, it's, you know, if you look at the history of the country, there's a, there's a lot that went into it and we need to kind of revert back to that because there was a lot more freedom. Now I understand the concern of a lot of people and, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, getting a lot of these people to accept our position so that we can make these changes in this country. And I think in order for them to feel more comfortable with that, you know, we need to let them know that we're not just going to open the floodgates. We're going to, we're, we'll test the waters. We'll start with small segments. Um, and the reality is, like I said, you know, because there isn't a floodgate, if we just loosen up our immigration laws a little bit, it's going to give a lot more people the freedom to travel back and forth. 
and it's not going to be holding anybody back because there's there's not a whole lot to hold back. So I, I think we could we could have some sensible transition there um, so that people can see this you know this isn't a big problem. It's yeah. easy to solve. All right, uh, Benjamin Letter, let's get your position on it. Um, well, first off, I, you know, like like I was saying earlier, I'd like to see you know some some legislative uh, ideas come from. Uh, our, our House candidates and our, and our candidates for U.S. Senate. Um, as of right now, I don't know of any of any bills uh, or anything being uh, shopped out there. Uh, now, as far as policy, you know, I think it's important that you know people uh, who do come, you know, are are treated with respect, um, and that we we don't have these situations where we're corralling people or abusing people. Um, and as far as you know, how I would use policy, I I, I want to see a, a better deal. Um, the countries that have uh, the best policy towards us uh, going there and uh, starting a business and, and purchasing property, uh, definitely those countries. Uh, I, I would do uh, you know what I could to in, encourage you know uh, you know. Uh, a strong uh, mutual migration agreement. Okay, and let's end with uh, William Hurst. All right, uh, I would ask two questions. Have you been convicted of a violent crime? And are you escaping justice in your home country or any other country? Those are delimiting factors. Outside of that, you're pretty much free to come into this country and try to be a citizen of this country. Uh, right now, right now we see it as 24 to 89% of uh, claims denied in our immigration court. And it really depends on which court you go to. Uh, we have two to 17 year olds uh, representing themselves in these courts. I'm pretty sure that they can answer if they have committed a violent crime or not, which a two-year-old may not have. Uh, and it is very unlikely that they're escaping justice by their own country. Some of these, some of these children that are seeking asylum or trying to come into the country are doing so on a precedent that they might be killed when they go back to their own country and we are denying their entry. So we need to open our borders or open our immigration to them. And I do yield my time on that. Okay, Arvin, I'm sorry. I think I missed you on this question. Go ahead. Uh, no problem. Let's, let's talk about just the most basic, obvious change that we could make right now. Today, the most important thing for the success of any business, more important than computers, more important than oil, is very skilled workers. And today, immigration policy is keeping those workers out, which is having the predictable consequence of having American companies either lag behind foreign competitors or sometimes just entirely go out of business because they can't compete with the foreign companies who can actually access the labor that we need. So the first thing I think we could all agree on is that let in people who have skill, those advanced skills, engineering, medicine, whatever. But the thing is, degrees don't really capture all that, do they? Some of the greatest entrepreneurs don't have any fancy college degree. They don't have any specific certification. They have gumption, they have creativity, they have will, they have drive. So how do you measure that? You don't need to measure that. Somebody's gonna come over here from China, be able to afford a plane ticket that's many, many times the average annual salary, is gonna go through all that. They're already gonna have a lot of those qualities probably. So the question is, what is it that we're trying to keep out? And the only thing that we need to be keeping out is people who are coming to be welfare parasites. And it's not that hard to keep that group out. You simply end all access to welfare. Simple things you could start doing right now and all supplemental security income. That often goes to, it's like social security for people who have never paid into social security. So if somebody comes in here in their 80s, having never paid in, now they're receiving social security. That needs to end, obviously. No government schools for people who have just come over here, obviously. 
and, and Medicaid, Medicare, uh, food stamps, all that kind of stuff that's attractive. So the question is just end welfare and everybody else, whether they're people that have a fancy degrees or just a lot of gumption, those are the people that create jobs and opportunity. Okay, moving on to the next question. Illegal immigration is badly incentivized by our long wait line, lines for legal immigration. Even substantially reduced screening times would still mean years of waiting in a potentially dangerous area with far less opportunities than what the United States has to offer. Right now, the U.S. attempts to balance letting in people who will contribute a great deal with people who are in danger. So how would you prioritize these families on the list? And as luck would have it, just so I don't skip you again, Arvin, we'll go right back to you again. To me, the priority for America should be what benefits people who are already here. And that's going to be anybody who's not looking for welfare. And that could be somebody with an advanced degree. It could be somebody with a lot of drive and excitement. It could be just somebody who happens to be lucky. It could just be somebody who's a little bit lazy, but not so lazy that they want welfare. One of the greatest inventions in human history came from a kid who was working on a train. And it's not because he was so dead set on inventing, he just didn't want to have to do his job. So he created an elaborate pulley system that opened and closed one of the valves and it became one of the most important innovations. Adam Smith talks about it in The Wealth of Nations. What we need to let in is basically anyone who's going to contribute. And that doesn't mean we need to do a special, will you contribute in the future magic test? That doesn't exist. All we need to do is say, if you come here, you're not going to get welfare. If you come here, you're going to actually have to pay for your own stuff. If you come here, you're going to have to work, not just be a parasite. That's it. I saw an amazing presentation not too long ago in New Jersey where a professor, he came from Scotland. He was an expert in his field, and it took him 20 years to become a citizen. 20 years for an expert in his field from you know, what would be seen as a Western, you know, not terrifying country of Scotland. I mean, that's, that's the kind of stuff that is absurd. We need to get rid of the wait lines. If you're here and you're not looking for welfare, you should be allowed right in. And if you wanna put in some basic security checks, you know, Gary Johnson had something that I would agree with in this case. You know, disease check, security check, and that's it. So if you're coming in here and you clearly have a very bad case of tuberculosis, maybe that might be an exception. But for any normal thing, here's what we need to do. We need to change the presumption. We need to change the presumption from a presumed, presumed no to a presumed yes. And maybe there might be a couple exceptions. I doubt it. But if we just have no borders, no welfare, we're going to get exactly what we want. All right. Two minutes on the button. Uh, Christopher Marks, let's turn that over to you. I don't know if you've actually heard the good news of this state. But the United States federal government is currently paying over $50 billion out of your Social Security trust funds to the state government. And the individual people are only receiving less than $30 billion a year. Wait, do the state governments actually contribute to the, social, uh, the overall Social Security trust funds? The answer is no, they don't. This is the United States federal legislative branch mismanaging your social security trust funds to, to the tune of over $50 billion a year. I'm not one that is one to throw the baby out with the bathwater, as they say. And I'm not looking to make a Mark's 2020 administration's campaign theme, bring out your dead for Monty Python. I don't want people dying in the gutters. And while... It is, it, it does sound very idealistic from a libertarian perspective of, you know, ending the welfare state. What I do understand to be true is that if you went in and you switched off the, switched off the Social Security Trust Funds today, tomorrow, or on the, on the nomination date of 2020, we would have grandmas and grandpas, elderly, disabled, and disenfranchised individuals dying in the gutters. We need to do some serious moral repair to this nation. We can systematically step back our social, uh, social security programs. Yes, this is true, it, but it's going to take some work. And as far as illegal immigrants coming here who have never contributed to said social security trust funds, the Marx 2020 administration is just going to be, we won't mismanage your funds. If you haven't paid in as a trustor to the trust funds, you don't receive benefits. So as a, as a border policy, 
let's issue everybody the ability to contribute to said social security trust funds, pay their tax contributions while we go on a three year program to phase it out. And that is my, that is the end of my policy. All right. Uh, William Hurst, let's turn that question over to you. Uh, I did miss tuberculosis in my last statement, which kind of covers this one. Uh, as far as people coming into this country who should be prioritized, uh, that would be people who are in danger. Uh, we should definitely not. Uh, we should definitely not overlook the amount of danger that they're in, or just be concerned over them trying to get welfare or this, that, and the other. Where it comes to labor we should definitely prioritize expert labor. We have a shortage of that in our country and across the globe. There are not, there are not nearly as many experts in any field as you would think. Allow experts in immediately. Just check for any violent crimes or anything in their, their history and allow them to join our workforce. It will help our overall economy. And I do yield my time. All right, thank you. Uh, let's get the thoughts from you, Benjamin Letter. Um, you know, I don't know if there's a, a, like a universal method of triage, that, you know, I could throw out there to say this is, this works, this algorithm works flawlessly in, in all situations. Uh, I think it's, it's case by case uh, in, in the event that there's a, a a disaster within, you know, uh, some of our neighbor countries. Uh, perhaps that might take precedent in, in that moment in time. Um, uh, of course, you know, we we want the uh, the best and, and the brightest uh, people to come here that we can we can attract. Uh, of course, we want people uh, to come here who uh, who are ready to uh, invest and, and work hard uh, in developing this country economically, um, but depending on what was going on uh, in any given Sunday, uh, you know, the, 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 pre the pro how you prioritize that may, may shift. Great, let's move on to the next question. Unbeknownst to most citizens until recently, we've had a decades long policy separating children from their parents at the border while they are being processed. On top of this, these applicants are locked in cages and made to sleep on concrete floors with plastic bags. It's come to our attention that we've failed on multiple occasions to ever reunite these families after we've separated them. Our explanation is that we have stopped child sex trafficking with this policy. Seeing as how our last two presidents gave direct orders to create these policies, what would your orders be on how to treat these applicants? And let's begin with Benjamin Letter. Um, well, I, I, I guess that it would depend on the, the circumstances of the situation. Um, if, uh, if, if uh, you or I were to, to get arrested, obviously, um, it's, it's not typical that we could bring our, our kids with us, uh, you know, to, to serve time or to be processed, uh, for a criminal charge. Um, so I think it would depend on, on how, 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 this all, how this all came to be. Uh, if, it were, if there was some kind of, uh, you know, sex trafficking or, uh, hu you know, human trafficking, uh, if this is, you know, do we know if this child belongs to this person to, to begin with? Um, you know, just think of somebody uh, leaving the country with, with your kid, claiming it's theirs. Uh, and that, you know, so there's, there's things that I think that everybody would want to, would want to know. Um, now if it's, you know, if it's a, it's a family that's coming here, that's, uh, looking to make a life for themselves and, uh, help develop this country economically, uh, there's, there's absolutely no reason to, to be separating, uh, those people, uh, or otherwise, you know, innocent, uh, travelers, uh, from each other, from their families, or from their children. Um, as long as it is their children, 
um, so forth. Sure. Uh, Arvin Vore, let's have you answer that question. That kind of practice is barbaric. I mean, separating parents and kids, in, on, in a practical sense, I mean, you separate parents from kids, you're basically breeding future criminals. But on a just moral level, separating parents from kids when they're going through an already difficult process is just insane. You're just traumatizing people with minimal to zero effect. I mean, if you want to crack down on sex trafficking, the biggest sex trafficking issue right now is what's going on in the domestic foster care system. That's where a lot of it's happening. And that's a problem. That's what happens, shows what happens when you let the government mismanage any aspect of child care. The government should not be involved in any kind of child care, not government schools, not foster care, not adoption, and certainly not with the completely pointless aspect, uh, job of separating parents and kids at the border. So no, I don't support that at all. That is never the right solution to any kind of situation to separate a parent and their child for no legitimate reason. What we need to have is a system that allows decent, normal people to come in. And that system is quite frankly, no borders and no welfare. If somebody comes in here and they have 53 kids and they're gonna provide for their kids food, clothing and education, what difference does it make to somebody else? That's their kid, that's their family, they're gonna take care of them. The only problem that I see is when people come in with kids and say, we're going to dump these, in, these kids in government schools, we're going to get a bunch of food stamps. That's the problem. So we can end the actual problem, which is welfare parasitism, without going to, this, to these barbaric and psychotic lengths of literally separating parents from their kids. Listen, when I was a kid and we went to a different country, I was nervous even though I was with my parents. I can't imagine how terrified I would have been if the first thing that happened when I stepped from the airport is I was separated from my parents, locked in a cage, and not reunited them for days. That's morally wrong, and I absolutely do not support it in any circumstances at all. Two minutes on the button. William Hurst, let's have, let's have you uh, give your ideas on it. All right. Um, it is reprehensible what they're doing at the border at the current moment. Uh, under my administration, this won't even happen to begin with. There would be no reason to detain an entire family. Uh, as far as trafficking goes, most countries have birth certificates. And most countries have the ability for a parent to prove that their child is there. Uh, one, of, one of the things that could happen along the way is they don't bring their documentation. But you can contact the other country for some sort of documentation or verification of this. Another issue is with people going in and out and our deportations they can bring in more children and keep making multiple attempts at uh, bringing in child sex traffic. Uh, I have not actually been able to find the full statistics on, on this to even be an issue. Uh, I think the biggest issue is in our country, not coming from other countries. And I do yield my time. Daniel Behrman, it's your turn. So I think this is an interesting question that we can always look at um, in, the, in the terms that the United States was created to be a group, um, a, a united um, a group of several states, and those states were intended to be sovereign. So whenever you ask a question about international affairs like this, you could ask, well, what would be the difference between states? So if there's a question of, you know, oh, how do we know these people coming across this border from Mexico to Texas um, who have a child? How do we know that child belongs to those parents? Well, how do you know that a, that a family moving from California to Texas with a child, how do you know that child belongs to those parents? Um, especially if that child is only two years old or two months old and can't speak. How do you know any of this? And, you know, do, I mean, when you go from California to Texas, we, we've talked about uh, birth certificates. Birth certificates aren't checked when you move from state to state. Um, and we can look at this a lot of different ways also. We, we could talk about um, welfare, background checks, all these other things. You know, there's a huge uh, immigration of Californians to Texas. And we don't have any checks in place to stop that. And a lot of Texans are concerned that, hey, Californians are going to come here and they're going to turn our red state blue. Um, it's a concern, but is, does, does the right that these people have to travel 
between these states um, interfere with that? What if, um, you know, what if Mexico became part of this United States contract and they became, you know, they had all the same rights and they paid all the same taxes and they were equal to us? Would any of this even be a question? Uh, we have to take into consideration some of that stuff because the presumption is that they are different from us, but the reality is everybody is the same. Um, you know, we shouldn't be separating families. We shouldn't even be stopping families. Um, if, if, you know, if a family's coming here, uh, you know, that's, let them come. There's, you know, there's another issue that uh, we keep bringing up uh, child sex trafficking or sex trafficking in general. And when we look at a lot of those statistics, um, a lot of what's called sex trafficking is actual, actually uh, consensual sex work. So, you know, those statistics are all blown out of proportion as to what's, what's actually people being kidnapped and Sorry. taken across state lines or, or border lines. Gotcha. Uh, Christopher Marks, why don't you close us off? Hi, I'm Christopher Marks of the Miami Nation, the indigenous people traditionally from the state of Indiana territory. I'm also a family rights activist. And as Arvin touched on it previously, um, a major problem of these uh, sex trafficking actually comes out of our foster care system. Yes, in fact, your state government is actually peddling children to people that are in fact on the child sexual, uh, the sex offenders list. They can adopt children in the state government. I remember as a child sitting on my grandfather's knee as he told me about my ancestors who were taken by the federal government or by the state government and sent off into boarding schools where they were stripped of their traditional indigenous names and given European names. Their hair was cut. This ended up resulting in the, in the courts ruling, yes, in fact, this was cultural genocide. Adolf Hitler appreciated what was being done to the American Indian people on the reservations, and he adopted said program and created the Jewish concentration camps. Now it has come back home to the United States again through our domestic foster care programs and our immigration programs, and these children were in fact put into the foster care system, which has a six times more likely um, you are uh, six times more likely to be molested, murdered, um, and physically abused whilst in the state's care. No, this would never be accepted underneath the Marx 2020 administration. It is cultural genocide. I yield my time. Great. <clears throat> if an immigrant, legal or illegal, commits a violent crime, how should we deal with it? Do we spend taxpayer funds to deport them or spend taxpayer payer funds to keep them here and detain them? Do you understand the foreign consequences of deportation and the domestic consequences if we do not deport them? And we will start with Daniel Berman. So this is an interesting question. And of course, uh, you know, we look at we look at the US criminal justice system, we've got 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prison population. And a lot of that is from the war on drugs. Uh, our prison system is overflowing right now with nonviolent offenders, people who did nothing but take drugs for themselves. We need to get rid of that. And that's going to take a huge burden off of our criminal justice system. Now, if somebody comes here and commits an actual crime, a felony, they harm somebody, we should deal with that the same way we deal with any other criminal. Because like I said before, the test about crossing state lines, if somebody murders someone in New Hampshire, does it matter if they came from Florida recently or would they be prosecuted in New Hampshire as a person, any other person who lived in New Hampshire their entire life? That's how we should deal with this. We've heard stories about people being prosecuted for murders, uh, rapes or, or other serious crimes and being deported because they weren't US citizens. And then they come back and do it again. And you know, it, then this is used as an excuse to say, oh, deportation doesn't work, we need a wall. Well, they're not coming across where the wall would be, so that's not gonna help. But yes, deporting them doesn't solve the problem. If, if whatever the solution is for a person of that nature who commits a crime in the United States, that needs to be the same whether they're a citizen or not. William, let's uh, have you answer that as well. All right, uh, a majority of this issue has to come down to treaties. 
uh, we are not allowed to prosecute uh, people from other countries because that is their citizen. Uh, what we need to do is work with other countries to guarantee that we can actually persecute somebody of a violent crime. If they commit a murder in the United States, they can't be deported. They're going to be tried for murder in the United States. We can't risk our own citizens on treaty just for somebody to say, hey, this is my citizen, not yours. So they can't, they can't be tried of any crime off of me. Uh, now, as far as other nonviolent crimes, uh, we hopefully should be taking care of that if there is any libertarian, uh, if any libertarian presence in Congress and in the presidency. So it might not even be an issue at that point. And I do yield my time. Great. Benjamin, what are your thoughts? Um, well, it's going to cost money either way. Uh, the act of deportation um, isn't isn't a simple thing. Um, uh, there's like a whole uh, network of uh, holding cells and processing uh, centers, uh, and it, I think it kind of depends on a, on a case on a case by case basis too. Uh, I think we all kind of recognize that. Um, if, uh, you know, who, which, who do they owe the debt to? You know, if they committed this crime and they owe a debt to, to, to this society, then, you know, and if it's viewed that way, then perhaps uh, you know, do, it, do it that way. Um, if, you know, it just, it really just depends on what, what crime has been committed, uh, and who is this person? How 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 did they get here? You know what what are they doing? Because uh, after their sentence, after someone's sentence is up, currently they can also be uh, deported as well. So I, I think that we need a lot of reform in this area, and it depends on a case by case scenario, and it, it might also depend by the, uh, the jurisdiction uh, as well. Some, some counties consider themselves uh, sanctuary counties or sanctuary cities. So uh, the people in that community have chose to do things differently. And I, I think that that's acceptable and we need to let communities uh, have a say in how they wanna run their community. Uh, Cause I'm from Dallas and we're one of the most diverse places you know, in the country. Uh, and I, it doesn't seem to be a problem. I think we uh, want to keep it that way. But other other places, they might want to preserve some kind of cultural thing that they have going, like you know, the Amish community or something. They might have something that they want to preserve. So it's up to them. Fine. Um, uh, let's go to Chris. How do you think? As I said earlier, I'm a Native American. Did you know that if you go onto an American Indian reservation, you commit a crime? The tribal courts do not have jurisdiction over anybody that is not of the indigenous people. This has led to some of the most violent crimes being, that are being committed on American Indian reservations, and that's because the federal government fails to intervene. Um, I think the same principal concept applies. We bring in, a, there are these, a, these immigrants that come in. It should be a federal matter. The federal court should be dealing with these things. And the federal government should be actually dealing with uh, the treaties between the, the two different nations, such as a more like an international justice treaty. Wherein, if you, if one of somebody, if a foreign citizen, a, a foreign nation citizen commits a crime in a foreign nation, the federal courts or the the overall encompassing courts then assume a, a supervisory role. Because let's just face it, ladies and gentlemen, the state governments are some of the most criminal organizations that we have in this nation. If you want to see justice denied, you want to see people's rights being violated, go to your local court and do some court watching and then bring your constitution and a pen and start checking off every single rights violation that occurs. 
don't get it don't get this wrong our justice system is not broken it is fixed and it's fixed in the financial interest of your state government and that is the reason why i am in fact running for president of the for a federal corporation because i want to restore federal oversight and make sure that the states are complying strictly to the constitutional values of this nation. We have a problem. We need to fix it. All right. And I won't forget you again, Arvind Vora. Let's close with you. There are a few things here at stake. One, as Daniel pointed out, we have a major amount of unnecessary prosecution going on. All the nonviolent drug criminals, people who just have a weapons charge, they don't need to be in prison. I've already uh, pledged to pardon them on my first day. So when it comes to things that are not actually crimes, let's let everybody free. There's no reason for those people to be in prison. Second, what about with people who commit real crimes? I mean, actual crimes with actual victims. Now that's a real situation. And there's been so much, so, many, so much great thought, so much great innovation happening in this area, ranging from people talking about restorative justice, where instead of you know, getting a jail punishment, you have to make up what you did to the, uh, to the injured party. Uh, you have people talking about private sector justice. David Friedman has talked extensively about different ways in history that people have managed justice without a government. I've often talked about how in the free market, we have ways to handle these without causing so much havoc. If, you, if somebody steals from you, the most common experience that most of us have with settling financial disputes is literally picking a drop down item on an Amazon menu, explaining why you're unhappy, and it gets taken care of so quickly that it doesn't even register to you as dispute resolution. But that's being handled so efficiently by the free, mar free market. But when it comes to things beyond that, whatever is done with a citizen, the same thing should be done with a non-citizen. You know, the United States is going around bombing every country without any provocation. I don't know why we've suddenly become so genteel about the rights of other countries when it comes to this one issue. But I would say that if you commit a crime in the United States, or if an American commits a crime in a foreign country, then the laws, however they're enforced, free market, public sector, whatever, the laws of that location should apply. So, there's no reason for there to be any kind of separation between the two when it comes to criminal justice. Great. Numbers from the Anti-Immigrant Fair Institute show that illegal immigrants are just an equal burden on America in terms of welfare than the average American, so long as we spend no resources trying to remove them from the country or deporting them. Still, if they are not U.S. citizens, should they be able to partake in any programs that are publicly funded? Or... Should, should they be forbidden to do so? Do your views on this change if they have an anchor baby in the country or if it's a child that you're dealing with? And we'll pick up where we left off. Arvin, go ahead. No, it doesn't change one bit. Welfare should not be given to, in my opinion, anyone at all ever, but it certainly should also not be given to either legal or illegal immigrants in any way. Now, before people go and say, oh my God, Arvin has such a cruel policy, that by the way is pretty much the current policy. Most welfare benefits are denied to illegal or legal immigrants for a fairly long period of time. What we need to change are those exceptions. Government schools, that's the biggest welfare program in the country. And that's something that should absolutely not be accessible to illegal immigrants, legal immigrants, or in my opinion, people who were born here, or people whose parents came over, or great, or ancestors came over on the Mayflower. Now, people, of course, want to say, well, what if they have, what if there's a child? What if there's an anchor baby? What if there's a child that's all by himself or all by herself? That is an area where charity and decency should actually take a role. I don't think that's an area where you should basically allow you know, manipulative mothers to have anchor babies and then game the system to their own benefit. And if you don't think that people are doing that, American citizens already do that. You can go to so many different cities where plan A is to get knocked up so you can get welfare. And these are just American citizens. I'm not talking about immigrants right now. That's happening here. And just as Americans do that, just as Americans do that intentionally get pregnant so they can get welfare, Sometimes immigrants do it too. The problem is not the immigrant. The problem is intentionally is a system that rewards people for getting irresponsibly knocked up so they can get welfare. I'm gonna to work to end all welfare. 
I'm going to end welfare for illegal immigrants. I'm going to end welfare for legal immigrants. And I'm also going to welfare end welfare for people whose, whose ancestors came over here in the Mayflower. Welfare is theft funded. Welfare creates a moral hazard. Welfare causes wrong decision making. And I will shut welfare down through any means that I can. All right, William Hurst, you're up next. I don't take this as a, uh, a question of who should have welfare or not. I take this as a question of why do we have people in our country that are not allowed to be citizens or are taking a year and a half to five, sometimes seven years to become citizens, staying in the country waiting on trials. Uh, if if we expedite the immigration system and add a few more a uh, few more judges we'll be able to take care of that entire issue right there so there's no question there's no question to answer here if we actually fix immigration to begin with so i yield the rest of my time benjamin letter Um, benefits. It, if we're going to have benefit programs, people that want to buy into those benefit programs can buy into those benefit programs and, and they can, they can benefit from them. Personally, I'm, I'm against, uh, government benefit programs, um, cause they don't really seem to, to work. Um, you know, uh, so As far as like the schools, like, uh, you know, I, I know Arvin, and, you know, is very uh, firm on his stance on uh, government schools, public education. Uh, we have some an issue here because uh, like the Texas Constitution, for instance, uh, ensures that, uh, you know, there's going to be a public education system. So federally, um, you you can't just you, you could you could take away you could abolish you know the, the you know the education department and everything federally uh and texas would still have uh government schools um and this is why it's important to allow communities to decide how how they want to run themselves um i think that that's often the solution uh it's very rare uh that uh something really needs to be solved on, on a federal level. Uh, those are for extreme, extreme cases. Uh, the powers of the federal government, they're, they're listed in, in, in this little document right here. It's small. It's not, it's not many things that the federal government needs to be worried about. Dan Berman, let's turn that over to you. All right. So, uh, let's first talk about schools. Um, I'm sure you know I want to get rid of the taxes associated with schools as much as Arvin wants to get rid of the schools themselves. Um, but the reality is immigrants coming to this country are paying for schools. Most schools in this country are paid for either by the lottery or a big one, property tax. And if they come here and they're renting a place or they buy a house, they are paying property tax. If they're renting and they don't own, they're paying the property tax through their landlord. They are paying for these schools. That's not that big of a burden on the system. Um, now, of course, we do want to end welfare programs without leaving anyone out, but we can look at those. Uh, New Hampshire did something where instead of drug testing everybody to try to get them off the program, they actually said, if you're able-bodied, we'll put you to work doing community service. And because of that, 80% of those people realized, hey, this is a really bad deal. I'm going to go out and get a job. And they went out and got jobs and that ended that welfare program. We can encourage people to get out there and do and, and make better of their lives without just taking their welfare away and leaving them on the streets. Um, now, another interesting thing is uh, in Crandall v. Nevada, which was an 1868 Supreme Court case, they declared that freedom of movement is a fundamental right and therefore a state cannot inhibit people from leaving the state by taxing them. Um, there, this, is, this goes to the, the talk about anchor babies. Uh, Meghan Markle and Prince Harry just got married um, and they're living over, over in London now. And uh, so what's happening from this is the US, the IRS is now saying, oh, well, you're married to the royal family. That means because of community property, you have to declare all of your property that's, that belongs to the royal family, you have to declare that to the IRS. 
Now, now they can't be taxed with the right to travel, right? But if you want to dissociate from the United States and give up your citizenship, there's a tax of $2,500. How does that fit in with this? Um, and, and then they're saying, you know, oh, well, she's going to have a baby there. That baby is automatically property of the United States government. That is a United States citizen just because the mother is a U.S. citizen. And unless she renounces her citizenship, that baby is going to grow up. And even though they're out of the country, they have to work and pay taxes on foreign income just because they're, they're associated with the United States. Uh, Christopher Marks, my rant list, my random list generator likes it when you go last for some reason. So once again, you will go last. The social security system is a trust fund. If you don't pay into said trust fund, then you don't receive benefits for said trust from said trust fund. So make it really easy for the immigrants that want to come here and do legitimate work to actually contribute to said trust fund. Believe me, after you take, get rid of that $50, $50 billion a year mismanagement, your, your social security system is going to be fiscally solvent again. Um, education, guys, we had a problem with illiteracy in the past in this nation. And if we get rid of the public education system, that illiteracy is going to reoccur. I believe me, as a family rights activist, I would much more appreciate it if we had a, the, a very simple, easy way to actually encourage homeschooling. We need to restore the nation back to one that has close family bonds. I think that it could be very simple. Instead of as a nation, we pay, paying for X number of uh, like hundreds of third grade teachers, we just create a day-to-day -day program that is freely accessible to anybody in this nation so that they could and just host it on a website. Just make a daily program and then you can, can, you, you can do homeschooling from home. It, if you want to actually have a teacher one-on-one -on -one experience, then yes, we could, we could look at Arvin's, Arvin's idea and we could actually, you could pay for a private education, but we do not in any way, shape, or form get rid of a public education system, even if it is in a virtual environment. But this means that we're gonna have to make a, a internet accessibility and, and technology accessibility more freely accessible. And then it doesn't matter if an illegal, a, illegal immigrant comes over, goes to one of our uh, public libraries and does their research there. Thank you. All right. Much like marijuana regulations, more and more cities, counties, states are refusing to, re to enforce federal mandates. When it comes to immigration, these cities are called sanctuary cities. These cities often receive federal money, federal money in order to operate. As president, we can, you continue to fund a city that refused to recognize your mandates, whether that mandate be immigration or another issue. And we'll start once again with Arvin. I think sanctuary cities are fantastic. When I see different cities nullifying federal laws, I think that is the exact right direction to go in. And it's not just immigration that they're nullifying. They're nullifying parts of the drug war. As we've seen entire states that have legalized marijuana. They're, they're nullifying pointless gun laws. We see so many states and counties and cities that say that they simply will not enforce any federal gun law. And I think it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Now, in terms of federal aid to cities, I don't think there should be any under any circumstance because what that allows to happen is you know, aid that really is just the money taken from the city, then given back to that city with strings attached. The most famous example of this is what happens with transportation and the drinking age. The federal government can't set a drinking age inside of a state, so here's what they do. They say, we're gonna tax all the people in your state through federal taxes, and then we're gonna give you back the money through for transportation if you have a drinking age of 21 or above. And that's the kind of nonsense that happens when you have federal aid to states. It's not aid, it's stealing your money, putting some strings on it and giving it back to you. So my position on federal aid to cities is not really dependent on whether or not it's a sanctuary city. I don't think there should be any federal aid, which is basically just money stolen from the city and then you know, a bunch of strings attached to it afterwards. Instead, I want to have as much autonomy as possible for cities, for individuals, for towns, for states. I want individuals to be able to set all the laws they want on their own property. I want a world in which your property rights are essentially sovereignty rights. 
where you can set whatever laws you want on your land. And that kind of innovation is going to give us be not just better laws and more choices and more freedom, but a sense of civic responsibility and a sense of responsibility to take care of those around you. And the improvements we get from that are not just financial, but moral as well. All right, two minutes. William, let's have you go, go on that one. I do believe that Arvin pretty much covers it. So I'm going to yield my time. All right, the ditto response. Uh, Chris, let's have you answer. Could you repeat the question one more time? Yeah, you bet. Much like marijuana regulations, more and more cities, counties, and states are refusing to enforce federal mandates. When it comes to immigration, these cities are called sanctuary cities. These cities often receive federal money in order to operate so long as they continue to enforce the, the immigration laws. As president, would you continue to fund a city that refused to recognize these, your mandates or any other federal mandates, whether that mandate be about immigration or another issue? Well, got some bad news for you. There was a time period in American history called the Articles of Confederation. Um, economically, that was a disaster. There was this whole states' rights thing. And then there were these, these people, they called themselves the Founding Fathers, and they had this convention. They called it the Constitutional Convention. And then they all agreed to the social contract and created a federalized-based government. Hi, I'm Christopher Marks. I'm a federalist, and I'm a constitutionalist. And I believe that Article 6, Clause 2 best, it best surmises that the, the Constitution, um, Constitution and treaties are the supreme law of the land. We are in a federalist nation. If the states do not comply with federal mandate, then yes, there is a simple solution for the federal government to address, and that is just do not pay them federal dollars. But being that this wouldn't pass constitutional strict scrutiny in its, at all, outside of the fact that the federal government has the ability of actually establishing immigration policy, and my policy would be, hey, if you didn't do anything wrong, come on in, work, and join our, uh, join our workforce, and increase the overall GDP for our nation. So, it really wouldn't be a problem for my administration. However, the, uh, the argument that there is this, uh, that we exist in this Articles of Confederation day and, t day and age is completely inaccurate. We need to go ahead and be honest and correct that narrative. Thank you, I yield my time. All right, Dan, how do you think? Well, first of all, you're not supposed to call it marijuana anymore. That's not politically correct. You can call it cannabis. Um, my bad. So, uh, so this is an interesting question, but you know, like Arvin said, the reality is that the federal government is taking money from states and then they're holding it and giving it back. Um, it's a wealth redistrib redistribution program and it shouldn't be going on. Now, the states themselves, you know, we talk about taxes and what's voluntary and uh, you know, there's a social contract supposedly. Well, if you look at the constitution, there's only a handful of people that signed it. I didn't sign it. Um, of course, I would have to take an oath to it uh, if I were elected. But what about the states? The states didn't directly sign the Constitution, but as uh, becoming members of the states, representative of the states did sign a contract. And so any states that joined the union afterwards joined under some sort of contract. And that allowed them to say, hey, we want to participate in this. We now have a contract with you. We can pay you taxes. But where does that tax money come from? Of course, the states steal it from their citizens or their residents. And this is another immoral practice. This is theft. If the states wanted to raise their money voluntarily and then give it to the federal government so that they could receive handouts in return, then that would be one thing. But this is a completely unlawful theft uh, practice that's going on. Now, another thing is if you read through the Constitution, the Constitution isn't really say we're going to take money from the states so that we can give money back to the states. It says we're going to take money from the states so that we can provide security, armies, uh, that sort of thing, that we, you know, elections for, for a president, that sort of thing. Um, it's not supposed to be there to redistribute wealth. So, you know, we shouldn't be giving money back to any of these states, no matter what, whether they're, whether they're sanctuary cities or not. All right, we'll wrap it up with uh, Ben. Business, does a president have pay 
paying money to cities in the, in the first place. Uh, I don't like the, the way that financial relationship sounds. Um, for what? Um, so I think we should, we should move, we should move away from that altogether. Uh, we've, we complain about the, the tax code and how complicated it is and, and all of this, these laws that we've, we've, we've put forth that are, that are so complicated that no one person uh, knows them. Um, I, it's, it, it's just, it's just, it's just a, a a mess and it, it takes away the sovereignty of, of a city to be to be financially influenced on the federal level and Republicans here in Texas uh, you know recently made this huge uh, showing of some of a, of, a, of a false noble effort to that they were gonna put a cap on the increase in, in property tax uh, but now you know the to make up for that they're gonna they, they want to increase sales tax so it's just a bunch of taking from the left pocket to put in the right pocket and move, moving it around. Um, and it's, it's causing a bunch of debt and, and cities, you know, are, are, are putting forth these certificates of obligations and then they're indebting uh, all the people that, that live there to try to go in on these federal deals and, and meet the, the, the mandates. Um, and we hear about the unfunded mandates and it's just a messy, uh, complicated relationship. I think cities would be a lot better off becoming not just sanctuary cities of whatever flavor they like, whether it's uh, immigration or guns, but sanctuary cities and uh, boycotting that uh, 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 exploitive t relationship, financial relationship with the federal government. Great. It's no secret that big corporations often pay large swaths of illegal immigrants well below the minimum wage. How to fix it has fallen apart before ever reaching legislation. Eliminating minimum wage would lower wages for many Americans. Yet allowing the practice to continue allows businesses to undercut citizens and creates a cluster of immigrant families that live beneath the poverty line. Do you have a bipartisan plan that could reasonably get through Congress? And if so, what is that plan? Daniel Berman, let's start with you. So first I wanna say, I don't really buy this idea of a poverty line. This is kind of a construct that somebody came up with and said, this is some amount of income and if you have less than that, it's poverty. Um, I, I have a family in Mexico that I went to visit, um, extended family on my wife's side and you know they live in a place where they, they live happily and they don't have any income at all. They don't have running water. They pull their water out of a well. Um, they grow their own chickens there. You know, th this, if you, if there were a person like this in the United States, you would call that poverty. But the reality is they're absolutely happy there. They're able to provide for themselves. Now, in terms of people who are in the United States and we have this standard of living that we're, that we've grown accustomed to, we shouldn't be able to say we need to lower that. But when you look at what's really going on, why is it so difficult for people to survive in the United States and stay above the poverty line? It has so much to do with what the government is taking from everybody. The government is taking property tax, they're taking income tax, gas tax, everything you buy, every time you earn money, they take from you, they take from you, they take from you, and that is what is making it so difficult to live. If you got rid of all the taxes on your paycheck, you would easily be able to double your income without having to raise the minimum wage. And the same would be true for any illegal immigrants that came here and started working. First of all, because they're illegal, they, they're, they have an unfair advantage in the, in the job market, so they have to take lower wages. And also because of that, um, the, uh, you know, they would be more willing to accept lower wages because they're, they're happy to survive on that, but they'd be able, we'd have cheaper goods that are produced in the country, which would mean everybody's cost of living would go down and the money that you earn would be more valuable. Ben Letter, you're next. Um, could you repeat this question? I'm not sure if I really understood what, what you were going after when you said, uh, sure. No problem. It's no big secret that big corporations often pay large swaths of illegal immigrants well below the minimum wage. How to fix it has fallen apart before ever reaching legislation. Eliminating minimum wage 
with lower wages for many Americans, yet allowing the practice to continue allows businesses to undercut citizens and creates clusters of immigrant families that live beneath the poverty line. Do you have a bipartisan plan that could reasonably get through Congress? And if so, what is it? Okay, yeah, that's, that's where I kind of lost you. Um, I, you know, I'm not saying that it's not happening, uh, that big corporations aren't side skirting labor laws, but labor laws apply to everybody. Um, now, I mean, I'm, I can't tell you if anybody's getting a pass on, on enforcement, but um, it's illegal to pay somebody less than minimum wage, as it is right now. Um, now, I don't think that minimum wage uh, is the, ha, you know, brings the great uh, economic benefit that uh, some of the, its advocates suggest that it, that it does. Um, we've seen um, a lot of indication that uh, when you artificially uh, increase uh, wages like that, that uh, businesses sometimes shut down, um, they, uh, they terminate uh, some of their staff. Um, and they take all kinds of measures in, in an effort to, to survive, none of which end up uh, benefiting uh, a large amount of, of employees like were, were promised. Uh, you know, I've been in the job market and sometimes, you know, taking a job, if you, if you can get a job and, and I've been an employer, uh, if you can get a job that's slightly less than minimum wage, not, every, not everything is really worth, the market doesn't pay. Uh, maybe it's part time. Employers need to be free uh, in order to adjust these relationships to where they're profitable and the business can be sustained. Uh, and employees need to be free uh, in order to, to negotiate uh, the, the best price that they can as an individual uh, for the service that they bring to the table. Great, Chris Marks. I've got two minutes, ladies and gentlemen, so we're gonna try to rush through this really quick. Essentially what you're telling me is illegal immigrants are actually doing the job cheaper, to, cheaper than American citizens, and this is driving down the overall compensation for said, pro, said uh, source of labor. Um, Democrats push up on the overall tax demand. Republicans push down on the overall tax contribution by those who are legitimately acting throughout the Commerce Clause. And this means that the overall, uh, overall burden of the taxation falls into you, the people's hands and laps. Um, so you are being disenfranchised in both regards through this way. The very simple solution is to allow them to participate and pay taxes into our system as we phase out the income tax, and pay into the social security system so that they can receive the benefits back that they, is, that they have paid into and overall make our, those who are acting throughout the Commerce Clause comply with the tax, the tax uh, obligation that are imposed upon them for the privilege to operate and conduct business within our United States territorial jurisdictions as well as the state territorial jurisdictions through the Commerce Clause. So overall, don't worry about going, this problem needs to be moved away and worry about just fixing the problem in front of you. When you fix this problem, this will end up causing your va the value of the labor that you provide to increase whilst also increasing the ability to, for us to lower the overall tax demand, regulate up the Republican, those who are involved in the Commerce Clause contribution to the overall tax base, and this will actually end up making it to where taxes are cheaper upon the people as well as the corporations. So I can't say that I've got a bipartisan process, a bipartisan solution because the Democrats desire to increase the tax burden. Time. They're going to feel a little slighted. I yield my time. All right. Arvin, Vora, let's move on to you. The first thing I would do is work to get rid of all minimum wage laws. This idea of a poverty line, as Dan pointed out, is, is fictitious. The amount of money you need to live in rural Wyoming is not the same as the amount of money you need to live in Manhattan. And having this sort of one size fits nobody type situation is just economically silly as well as morally dubious. What I'm gonna work to do instead of 
making the people who are not complying with problematic laws comply with them, I'm going to try to get rid of the problematic laws in the first place. I want to get rid of all labor laws. I want to get rid of all, all taxes. Dan's right about one thing, that if you just had to pay for the thing you're buying, not the thing you're buying plus excise fees, plus additional fees, plus the increase in cost that the producer has to deal with, if you're just paying that, then almost everything you buy would cost, cost a fraction of what it does now. Throughout most of human, throughout recent history, here's what we've seen. We've seen Americans become harder working, going from two families, uh, from a single fa income family to, to multiple income families. And yet, today people are struggling. What one person could provide in the past, today two people are struggling to provide. In the past, people didn't have all, all this advanced technology to make their labor more efficient. And today, the advanced technology is making our labor more efficient. So why is it so hard for us today? Why is it so hard for not, not just immigrants, but for everyone? It's because that money is being taken from you through one kind of tax, another kind of tax, tariffs, et cetera, and that's driving the price up of things. And you're just basically paying for wars and idiocy. I wanna end the welfare state. I wanna end all wars. I wanna end government spending in government departments. And the result of that is that everything is going to be much, much cheaper. You won't have to pay these exorbitant prices if all that is removed. So the solution is not to make people comply with silly laws, it's to get rid of those laws in the first place, and I'll do everything I can to make that happen. William Hurst. All right. Uh, I don't think bipartisan is a good, good way to put anything dealing with minimum wage or immigration. There is no possible way. Uh, as far as the minimum wage goes, it helps people keep people at that low rate. It basically sets a fixed rate to say that, you know, we're giving you what is acceptable and we're going to keep you here. Uh, we do need to remove minimum wage. There's no bipartisan way to get uh, to do that. Uh, and immigrants make far more than you might think. Uh, a lot of people think that they make less and get the job, but it's been in my experience that they make about eight dollars to ten dollars an hour in some of the same jobs that Americans get paid minimum wage for. Uh, it is more reflective of a free market. Uh, you know, it, they might be doing it illegally, but it reflects a free market without that standard of minimum wage and. I think that, uh, that that should be a good case right there for us to get rid of minimum wage to begin with. It has nothing to do with whether or not you're a legal or Ill illegal immigrant. And I yield my time. Great. In spite of our border concerns, the overstayed work visa is still the leading cause of illegal immigration in this country and the world over for that matter. Would you reform the practice of giving skilled laborers work visas in a way that protects the taxpayers better? We're going right back to you, William. Could you repeat that? It kind of cut out. Sure. In spite of our border concerns, the overstayed work visa is the leading cause of illegal immigration in this country and the world over, for that matter. Would you reform the practice of giving skilled laborers work visas in a way that protects the, the taxpayers better? I don't believe that there should be an end to a work visa. If you're here... If you're here providing something that is benefiting our economy, stay here and keep doing that job. We need, we, we need experts in many fields and that diversity helps our overall economy. So I would, I would change the visa system to be open-ended and I yield my time. All right, Chris Marks. You know, illegal immigrants, I don't believe, make more money than Americans that are working legally do. Um, matter of fact, when I was doing home PC repair, I used to do some work for some illegal immigrants. There were essentially six guys that lived in a two-bedroom apartment, and they ended up and they actually owned houses. But they went to this two-bedroom apartment, and they literally did their Monday through Friday shift, and then during the weekends, they left and went back to their homes. 
Um, some of them even went back to their native na their native countries, and yes, they were illegal and were able to go home for the weekend and still make it back into the border. Clearly, we got a problem. We got a problem if this is something that we're focusing on controlling. Um, so just don't worry about that. If we have people that want to come into this nation to conduct to perform labor services, what does this mean? This means that there are jobs. This means that there are businesses here that need labor force. Let them work here. Let them purchase products here. Let them go back home to whatever nation they originate from for the weekend and then fly back in to our nation to go back to work. It makes biz. It brings. Jo it means jobs want to actually do bring more jobs here. Um, so it's not a really a problem. Uh, I yield my time. All right. Uh, that question goes to you, Ben Letter. Um, I think uh, perhaps uh, we might need to create uh, a new classification of uh, a visa or you know, a longer, a longer term one. Um, you know, I could imagine you know coming here and uh, investing all this time and effort into building a business here and building a life here, and then having a visa come up, um, and then that just being a bureaucratic uh, nightmare. Um, why do they why do they need to expire like uh william william said well maybe we could um, create a type of visa that either you know doesn't expire uh that way people feel secure in making long long-term investments into this country um or has a really long-term extended expiration date great uh dan berman so one thing I want to say is from traveling around the world and seeing what kind of different policies other countries have, the more restrictive a country is in allowing people into its country um, within its borders, uh, the more restrictive it is, the less it has. And the reason for that is people aren't able to go there. They're not able to contribute to their GDP. They're not able to import things that increase the value of of the country itself, the the the, um, the the quality of life, or the ability of the workers who are in that country to work more efficiently, um, you know, there's there's a lot of things. That, there's a lot of different ways we can look at this. And you know, as as everyone mentioned before, if you're working here and your visa expires, that stops you from leaving because once you leave, you probably can't get back in. That's a real thing. Um, but also consider, you know, people are worried, oh, they're, they're going to work here. They're going to take their money out of the country um, if, you know, if we open that up. And that's not really that big of an issue. I mean, think about a person who might uh, work in New York City. And once they earn all the money from New York City, they're going to move to Wyoming. Are they really taking that money out of the economy? Things are going to fluctuate all the time. Things fluctuate just from inflation, which is a government created um, artificial control over the value of money in the first place. Um, whether money goes in and out of a city really isn't that big of a difference. We're sending tons and tons of money to China, but is our is the value of our country going down because of that? No, it's actually increasing because all the money we're sending money there, but then it comes back in the in the in the form of products that are you know less expensive electronics and TVs and and furniture and whatever else we're buying from overseas. So, you know, the, we're not hurting anybody by allowing people to come here and work, and we're not hurting anybody by allowing money to travel all around the world. In fact, the, the more freely money is able to travel, the more it's going to travel here and the more valuable this country is going to become. All right, right on two minutes. We'll conclude with you, Arvin. We finally come to the heart of this issue. The distractions that have been used have been to point out that some, immigration, that some immigrants do crime a small, small percentage significant, far different, greater differences in their ideas than immigration, immigrants of the same generation in different countries. But the one thing that immigrate, immigrants do is that they do work. And that scares the hell out of people. Because the simple fact is, if you think I hate welfare, you should talk, talk to a few skilled worker immigrants or a few unskilled worker immigrants. However much I hate welfare, I don't have a candle to how much they well, hate welfare. 
People say that immigrants might come over here and, you know, have these leftist ideas that are all pro-welfare and all this kind of stuff. That's not what they're afraid of. They're afraid that the immigrants are going to come over here and say, well, if I'm working and I had to come over here from a different country, learn a different language, get off your lazy button. You can work too. Immigrants are by and large very anti-welfare, except for the very specifically hand-selected immigrants that the government tries to let in, not because they're afraid that they're too far, uh, not, not because they're so anti-welfare, because they're pro-welfare. They, the government wants to let in statists. And people who are fleeing the incompetency of their government, they don't want the incompetency of our government either. Look at Lily Tang Williams in Colorado. When I talk about how bad welfare compared to the way she talks about ending welfare, she came here from China. She doesn't much care for communism or socialism or anything that looks like any of those. So when she speaks against it, she speaks passionately and powerfully. Bringing in workers is not just going to bring in is not just going to bring in the economic value though it clearly does but it brings in the cultural value of people understanding that work is something that's actually productive and beneficial not just a lazy hobby or something that you do as a potential alternative but the right alternative to a welfare state awesome guys let's go to our last question the citizenship test has been grounds for ridicule for some time now what test would you propose to give an immigrant to ensure that he or she is not a safety threat and will be a productive member of society? Also, seeing a huge correlation with welfare recipients not being able to speak English, would you have a language requirement be part of that test? And we'll start with you, uh, Benjamin Letter. Um. <sighs> the... Uh... The citizenship test is a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a cool process. Uh, you know, I think, you know, I've, 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 I've never taken the citizenship test. Uh, you know, however, I think it's pretty clear that, uh, you know, I, I, I know that, uh, you know, I, my family immigrated to this country. Um, I don't recall anybody taking a test in, in the process of, of doing that. Um, I don't know when this test was implemented, uh, nor what the, the grand motivation uh, was. Uh, but I think if, if we implement some of the solutions that were discussed here today, uh, having some longer term visas, uh, having some uh, in, improving the, you know, our, citizen, uh, our, our, our migration agreements with, with other countries, um, that we can, we can improve the, the, the situation uh, as a whole. Um, I don't think the subject of immigration is necessarily just one way. What, what about people coming to America? I think that uh, Americans going to other countries is a good thing. Uh, for instance, Daniel has essentially semi-migrated to Mexico. Uh, and I, I see him making videos of him spending money uh, in their economy all the time. I'm sure that Daniel's a, a net positive to Mexico. I believe one time I was on the phone with him and he had construction workers there. Um, I'm assuming those were local construction workers. Um, so I think that by Americans going to uh, some of these other countries that we can help to, to uplift them and negotiating those deals that enable American entrepreneurs like Daniel to go to places like Mexico uh, and other countries uh, and help to uh, economically develop them uh, and lend that entrepreneurial skill and, and breed that, that American entrepreneurial spirit into those countries. I think that we alleviate some of the need that drives what Fine. some would call the, the, the crisis, which I, you know, I think is largely overstated. Okay, speak of the devil, Daniel, you are next. So there's a couple things I want to address. Uh, one is the pockets of people who don't speak English that are already in this country. There are plenty of places you can go where people don't speak English. It's not their, it's not their first language. They're legally uh, immigrated here or they're children of people who have immigrated here. Um, there are people who speak uh, French, uh, Chinese, Spanish all over the country. Um, and a lot of them don't speak English or a lot of them use, uh, use English as their second language and they primarily conduct their business in these first language because 
everybody else in the cities where they are speaks that same language. Now, if you're worried about immigrants coming to the United States and not learning to speak English, well, guess what? If, if you own a shop and they walk into your town, you're not going to have to worry about doing business with them because they're probably not going to go to your shop because they know they don't speak English and they're not going to be able to communicate with you. That doesn't mean you shouldn't allow them to travel to somebody else's house. You don't have the right to tell them, hey, um, I, I have a, you know, somebody lives in a, in a town that primarily speaks Spanish and they don't speak any English there and all the shops and everything are in Spanish. You don't have the right to tell them, hey, everybody there, you have to make all your signs in English, even though I'm never going to travel there. You're never going to travel there. What difference does it make to you? Now, there is one thing that, that people are worried about when you call. And I've heard so many people complain, I don't want to have to press one for English. Well, guess what? There, when I was in Mexico, I bought a computer part. And that computer part was manufactured in the United States. And their manuals were in English and Spanish so that they could export them to Mexico and other South American countries that speak Spanish. If you force them to say, hey, you can't have Spanish and your customer service line, when anybody calls it, you can't tell them, hey, you have to press one for, uh, one for English. That means they're not going to be able to provide customer service to people in Latin America, which means you are going to prevent American companies from exporting their products and importing money. It's counterproductive. It's stupid. It's insane. And it's just fear and propaganda that we've been fed through lies. Great, you're right at two minutes. Uh, let's move on to William. All right, no, I do not believe that there should be any language requirement. Uh, we speak a ton of different languages and there is no set language for the United States. A lot of us speak English. Uh, for instance, ich spreche in Deutsch. Uh, I do believe other people here speak other languages, it is diversity. Uh, as far as the language thing goes, how does Canada deal with their French speaking native? Uh, we also have Native American language, which is completely different from English. And some people do actually still speak that. As far as, as, far as the questions go, or the immig immigration questions, they're going to stand, as I said before, are you, are you, uh, have you been convicted of a violent crime and sentenced to it? Are you escaping justice in your home country or any other country? And are you sick with a communicable disease? Right now, as it stands, if you look at a flow chart of our immig immigration process in whole, it looks like the schematic for a computer processor. It's ridiculous. Uh, it would take a literal electrical engineer to be able to get through that flow chart. And I will yield my time on that one. Okay, well, uh, fitting. Christopher, you're next, you wind talker, you. Hi, Christopher Marks of the Indigenous Miami Nation. I am adamant, sarcastically, I am at, very adamant about forced assimilation. And I strongly believe that wherever you plan on landing your feet and taking up residency, you should be required to pass the Native American citizenship test, know how to fluently speak dead and dying languages of American Indian people based on the, the treaties that were established with the first United States of this nation. Because otherwise, on a more serious note, there are a massive number of US people that couldn't even pass the US citizenship test as currently. We don't need to have government interfering and in preventing skilled laborers from coming in here, bringing in good qualified people to provide to our work force in this nation, encourage companies to come in here, conduct business so that the government can tax, the, tax those businesses through the Commerce Clause to actually assist with financing this government and overall 
relieving a significant number of the overall tax burden from the constituent taxpayer base as we migrate utilizing a three-year phasing out policy of taxes at all being paid from people and make it to where the government has an honest revenue stream Come on, ladies and gentlemen, we have a $22 trillion deficit. We are in the red. We are trying to run a business that doesn't have an honest revenue stream. Help a brother out on fixing this. All right, we'll end with you, Arvind Vora. Let's talk about the first issue, citizenship tests. To me, there's only one test that matters. Are you going to be a welfare drain? And I don't think you need to test it. I think you just need to end welfare that anybody whose goal is just to get welfare will pick literally any other country on earth, including Somalia, before they come here. That's how little welfare I want the United States to have. But let's talk about English. English is the language of success in the world right now. And because of that, in the free market, people do their best to learn English. English doesn't need any of our help. As a language, I think it's beautiful. It combines and the Latin roots with the Anglo-Saxon roots really create a remarkable language. But in a practical sense, it is in such high demand that any, almost any native English speaker can get a job in many, many countries just teaching English. That's how badly people want to learn English. I don't think we need to help them with that. I remember after my first book, The Equation for Excellence was published, and not too long after that, we got a letter from a Chinese publishing company that, that represented a much larger university than, than the way it was published here. And I was overjoyed. I, you know, I read through the broken English and I thought maybe it was fake, but if it wasn't fake, it was kind of cool. When it turned out to not be fake, I was extremely excited. Now, a few years ago, the 10th anniversary of that came up, which meant they needed to re renew the contract. And the only thing that really changed is now the English was flawless. English is in demand and the free market always seeks to improve itself. These aren't people who are trying to leave China. These are people working in China. These are people in China, and that's how badly they want to learn English. Now, I want to say to speak to something that Dan Behrman said a second ago, when he talked about how a lot of people find it annoying to have to press one for English. I agree. I find it annoying to press one for English, and companies in the free market are responding to that. They check your area code. They see if you're, native, if you're an American, if you're in the United States, and if you are, they don't ask you to press one. They just ask you to press two if you want Spanish. The free market is taking care of it. We don't need the government to help. Candidates, thank you so much. We're going to move on to your closing statements. I do have a statement submitted by uh, Kim Ruff, who's ordinarily part of these debates. She is getting married this weekend, and we wish her the best. But she did want me to uh, read this statement for her closing statement. <clears throat> Fellow candidates, Mr. Moderator, and members of the audience, I would like to thank We Are Libertarians, generally, and Hody Johns, specifically, for permitting me the opportunity to write a statement he could read on my behalf during tonight's debate. I very much appreciate it. As some of you may be aware, I was unable to attend tonight's debate because my fiance and I are getting married this weekend. I know that members of the Libertarian Party and general public are eager to hear the Ruff Phillips campaign stands on immigration, as this is actually an issue that we effectively address in the role of president. As such, I will address every single question and issue brought up in tonight's debate in a separate video to be released next Friday on our website at ruffphillips2020.com. On that note, I will also do the same for the topics discussed during the healthcare debate and post that as a video on our website. It is critical, not only as individuals running for office, but as representatives of libertarianism, that we make every possible effort to address these issues to show the inherent humanity of our philosophy and how, as political ideology, it is distinctly different and markedly better than what is being preached and generally accepted as gospel within our nation. Finally, to my fellow candidates, I apologize for not having had the opportunity the past two debates to sit with you and engage in this incredibly crit critical discussion. I look forward to joining you during future engagements as we continue on the campaign trail and our shared fight for freedom and liberty. Kim Ruff. And we will have uh, Arvind Vora go next. No borders, no welfare. That is my immigration policy, and it's going to bring benefits to those already here. Now, a lot of people who are opposed to immigrants, they'll try to trick you. They'll say all immigrants are here as refugees looking for welfare or other folks looking to commit crimes. But the simple fact is most people are coming to America to work. And we need to turn immigration to something that brings the best and brightest from all over the world right here to America, to make America the most innovative, the most productive, the most prosperous nation in the history of the world. 
Now, we've lost a lot to immigration. And so many other things are even easier to export because honestly, it's harder to ship a car than to ship a computer program, a design file, a blueprint. The, a car is about as hard as it gets, and that's already gone overseas. Now, rather than sending all these jobs overseas, I say let's bring all those sectors right here. The way to do that is by having totally open borders, not just to people who have, who have very obvious skills and degrees, but to that great entrepreneur who might not have any formal qualifications, but is just waiting to do something incredible. And here in the freest country on earth, even now, even despite our shortcomings, here in the freest country on earth, this is where you should do it. What we've seen over the last year is, is reverse immigration. Great people leaving the United States co-founder of Facebook leaving the United States. We've also seen so many great innovators in their own countries staying in those countries. And that to me is just as bad. I want all the great innovators in every country to say, listen, if you're working hard, if you wanna be productive, the only place to go is the United States of America because that's where you have no borders, no welfare, no income tax. My name is Arvind Bora. My website is votebora.com and I'm running to end the welfare state and the immigration and and the end the welfare state and the income tax and have open borders. All right, we'll move on. William Hurst, your closing statement. Immigration issues are much more to do with fear than logic. Ooh, there goes my statement. And they are much more to do with fear than logic and freedom. Logic dictates that if we work with other countries via treaties, we can make an immigration system that is accurate and fast for better immigration and immigration. A system, a system that allows freedom of movement while protecting our citizens and allowing for, allowing for us the chance to protect asylum seekers. Allowing our country to continue, continue to be diverse as it has always been allow our country to thrive from this proven economic benefit. It is my goal to maintain our safety and our freedom and our prosperity. Immigration reform is a must in this goal. An open yet secure border is imperative to this overall goal as well. I fully intend to help fix this process that is deeply broken. All right, Christopher Marks. As the only native individual in this candidacy dealing with illegal immigrants, I would like to share a few inspiring words with you. Tacos, calamari, sushi. These are all things that have been, bore, it been imported into the uh, Native American, uh, onto the Native Americans' lands. I can tell you firsthand if you've ever had truly indigenous American Indian food, it is bland. And I fully embrace and love the diversity of all of the immigrants that are upon the indigenous people's lands. You have added to the flavor, the zest of the United States of America. Do not stop this growth. Do not stop this embracing of other cultures. You will never know the flavors that can be brought into our society. And I'm not talking exclusively in regard to food the zest, the zeal of other cultures, the diversification will be embraced. We will grow and we will prevail. The Marx 2020 administration is very simple. I want to make our government fiscally solvent. I want to bring us out of the red. I want to give the government an honest revenue stream so that the true socialists, the true welfare babies of this nation, the state and government employees will actually have legitimate, honest work to do so they can earn a paycheck. And let's not go ahead and dismiss people from other nations that want to contribute to the overall GDP of this nation. Together, 
We make America great. Thank you. One small correction. Elizabeth Warren is running for president as well, Christopher. So you're not the only, not the only one. <laughs> uh, Benjamin Letter, let's, let's go to you. Um, immigration uh, and uh, economic development, it's a, a two-way street. Um, currently, the, the United States actually does have the, the best immigration policy in comparison to the other 194 or five countries. Um, it can be improved and it should be, um, but we should, we should also be looking to uh, look to improve our ability to go to other countries and you know help participate in in their development process as well personally i think that uh creating an environment where that can happen uh, is probably a lot more beneficial than all of these uh foreign aid programs that we have uh we, we send all the uh, we're always hearing about all this gargantuan amounts of money uh, going in what they label as foreign aid to all of these countries, a lot of the same countries that uh, uh, you know we see a lot of people um, coming from uh, in, in large crowds. Uh, you know they call it the caravan. Um, I think that if people were to be able to go down there and start up, uh, you know, businesses and and actually uh, participate in the economic development, that that would stabilize those countries. Um, and that's why I think that negotiating a good migration agreement uh, is beneficial for, for everybody. Um, I think it's the issue is not just uh, what about people coming here. I think our ability to go there and actually participate in the development uh, could be really beneficial for everybody. Great. And the closing, closing statement will go to Daniel Berman. So I guess I'm a little bit biased because I love to travel, but having been to uh, four continents and going to my fifth continent this weekend, um, I've seen what there is to offer in the world. And there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of information. There are a lot of things we can learn from everybody. There are different ways of, of solving common household problems that we can learn from people. Um, you know, we, we've talked a lot about propaganda and fear and, and how we're taught to fear immigrants um, and immigration and what's going to happen if we, if we allow people into the country. Um, this, you know, as they say, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. It's so true. We're told, you know, everything that we're sold is based on fear. Even if, you know, nothing that has to do with government. If you talk about um, beauty products, they, they try to tell you, hey, you need to be afraid that you're not going to be accepted in society if you don't look a certain way. They use fear. They prey on you with this. And it's, it's absolutely terrible. And once we get over the fear, we realize we can travel around the world and people from around the world can travel here. And it's not that big of a deal. There's, there's not this epidemic of, of crazy people that want to come to the United States and just murder us. Um, and and the, probably the biggest population of people who could be accused of wanting that are ones that we've been dropping bombs on for decades. So it's a bit hypocritical for us to say that we want to do this. We've been, the United, I don't want to say we, but um, you know, the United States government and its policies, which is, you know, dictated by a very small handful of, of political uh, of politicians has been going around the world and exploiting resources and controlling financial markets and dropping bombs. I've traveled to places in the world and their banks, their, their financial markets, everything, they're controlled by the United States. I can't walk in there with cash because they have this KYC uh, law that's implemented all over the world. And the first thing they want to do is they want to verify what country you're from. And as soon as they find out you're an American, they start asking you to fill out IRS forms. Why? You're in another country outside of the United States. Why do they even have IRS forms? It makes absolutely no sense. The United States government is controlling all these other countries, and then they want to tell you, hey, don't let those people in here because they're going to do bad things while we're doing all these bad things around the, the world. It's, it's absolutely insane. Um, you know, we talk about, I, I talked about moving from state to state. The United States, we're, we're taught to believe that we're living in some ivory tower and we can't let the peasants in from around the world. 
That's not how it works. There are people in Beverly Hills who can freely travel from, from the nicest part of Beverly Hills to the poorest parts of Los Angeles. They can get there in a day. There are no border checkpoints. There's nobody saying, hey, you can't take this money out. You can't get a job in Beverly Hills and take the money that you earned and take it to a poorer neighborhood because that's not a thing. Realistically, it doesn't make that big of an impact on people. If you have wealth, it's going to get spread around. That's just how it works. And that's how we should look at the entire world. Uh, you can find out more about my platform on Berman2020.com. You can volunteer and donate there as well. Thank you. Great. Candidates, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate all of the dedication, your work, your enthusiasm, and your thoughts on the subject. They're clearly well thought out, and you've got a lot of information for our listeners to, to hear. If you are listening to this program, I really ask you to share this. Uh, the candidate debate series has been doing well. It's been doing exceptionally well. I want it to be doing unbelievably well on the downloads and the views. We're getting the word out there, but with our candidates donating this much time, the Real Libertarians Network just wants to make it worth their while. And that means sharing this. Share it with your friends, download it, like, rate, review. Tell us what you thought. Tell us the good and the bad. Believe me, Having known all these candidates, they are perfectly fine with responding to criticism. Let them know. Visit their websites. Tell them how you feel about them. That's the whole way this thing keeps going around. Special thank you to our Patreon subscribers that keep us going, keep this afloat. Well, tune in in two weeks. We are actually going to be discussing science, energy, and education, and that's going to be a hot program. It's going to be a lot of fun and very cerebral, and I'm sure you will just love it. Until then, friends, thank you for tuning in and keep fueling the fires of liberty.